Hello class. Today I'm going to cover what we covered in class yesterday, which is the start of chapter 2, the structure and properties of organic molecules. Since we didn't have class on Monday, this is just the lecture notes for yesterday, January 22nd, 2014. Like I said, we started chapter 2, which was the structure and property of organic molecules. And the topics that we covered yesterday, and then we'll continue to cover next week in class, was molecular orbital theory, which you might have heard of before, hybridization, which is where we're going to get to next, isomerism, talking about different types of isomers. Uh, there's This is a big concept in organic chemistry, and there's actually a whole chapter devoted to it, chapter 5. Um, so we're just going to touch on it right now and kind of introduce the idea of it, and then we'll dig way deeper in it when we get to chapter 5. I've already brushed through intermolecular forces, but we'll touch on those again. They also have to do with solubility. They're directly related. If you're in lab, you'll understand how that works in the upcoming weeks. And then last, we'll just briefly talk about the types of hydrocarbons. Because there's a couple different types. And they do different chemistry. And therefore, they get their own chapters in the textbook. All right, so molecular orbital theory. Orbital. Molecular orbital theory is a way to model how atoms and bonds make molecules, right? So back in the olden days, you know, the 1920s of chemistry, for example, we didn't have some of the powerful spectroscopic techniques that we currently have for uh, chemistry that we have now. So people had to come up with different ways to explain the results that they saw. One of the ways that they came and, unex and explained such a thing was through molecular orbital theory. So essentially it's just a model, it's a somewhat realistic model, but it's still a model nonetheless, of how atoms bond to make molecules. And they do that using atomic orbitals. So essentially what they're going to do, the atoms that are, the atomic orbitals are going to recombine to make molecular orbitals, and that's what we're going to look at. So for example, remember from Gen Chem we learned electronic configuration, right? That was the fancy way to say things like 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, Da, 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 whatever, for whatever element you're talking about, right? So that very clearly says that this atom, whichever one I'm talking about, has a 1s orbital and it has two electrons in it. Then it has a 2s orbital and it has two electrons in it. Then it has a 2p orbital and has six electrons in those three suborbitals, etc., etc., etc. And last time or a week ago, we said something like a, an s orbital is a sphere with the nucleus in the middle, and that the p orbital is actually kind of like a little dumbbell shape. There are three of them in three different orientations in space, Px, Py, and Pz, and they're all exactly the same as each other. Okay. Well, it turns out that's not the whole story, right? If you just take atoms together and use s and p and d and f orbitals, you can't actually account for the geometries that you actually see in real organic molecules, or real molecules in general. And so there has to be something else going on. And that other thing that's going on is called hybridization. And I'm not going to get into it in too detail just yet. First, I want to look a little bit closer at the orbitals and how the orbitals uh, mix or why they do what they do. Okay, so for example, we talked a lot about hydrogen yesterday. Hydrogen just has a nice and simple case. Example, hydrogen. 1s1. It has a 1s orbital, lowest possible energy orbital, and it has one electron in that orbital. <laughs> Very boring. I can model it by drawing a circle with a dot in it. Right. The dot is the nucleus, the circle is the electron cloud, the electron density, it's the orbital itself. You can think of it a few different ways. If we wanted to draw a graph of it, we could graph it like this. We could say, well, if we graph electron density on the y-axis and the distance from the center distance from the center of the orbital, it turns out that we get a function that looks kind of like this, right? And it peaks at some point, right? So essentially there's this place in the center of the orbital, which I'm just going to denote as a circle, that has the most amount of electron density, but as you go farther away, either out from the orbital or in from the orbital, 
you actually get less and less density, but there is still some amount there. And if you actually do the math, this contails, this tails out for infinity. It doesn't ever actually hit zero. So if you keep just going, it just gets smaller and smaller. So technically, there's electron density from everything everywhere. Technically speaking, if you want to follow the math to that absurd level. Okay, that that becomes important because what it says then is that it's not the case that we have a nucleus and we have a well-defined little sphere of an electron and he moves around in a circle like this, kind of way the Earth moves around the Sun, but rather the orbital itself is kind of blurry. So the nucleus is a nice little sphere, or at least we're going to think about it for that, but technically it's not. And the electrons, instead of being a nice well-defined path, are kind of like this really blurry, sloppy-looking, scribbly thing. And there's electron density outside, and there's a little bit more electron density, and then there's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less, and the same thing on the inside, there's a little bit less, a little bit less. Right? It's very fuzzy, put it that way. So we have these two fuzzy blobs that are going to come together and interact. Now one of the things about orbitals, that molecular orbital says, is that orbitals have phases. Sorry, I don't know where that screech is coming from. I don't know if you can hear it or not, but I can. Orbitals have phases. So if I have a hydrogen atom, and it's kind of fuzzy, I'm just going to do that to represent my fuzzy hydrogen atom, and I take another hydrogen atom, it can have one of two phases. It could be, um, I don't like to use the term positive and negative like you'll see in some textbooks or online. Um, usually I use like shaded and non-shaded for molecular orbital theory, but for now I'm just going to use, you know, one version and the other version. So we'll say that the two phases for this hydrogen atoms, we'll say they're in phase, they agree with each other, right? They just happen to be the same. There's two flavors. Think of it as flipping a coin. You flip a coin, this one could be heads or tails. You flip a coin, this one could be heads or tails. If they're both heads or they're both tails, they agree and they're both in phase. When they bond, they form what we call a bonding molecular orbital, which is also fuzzy, right? So this would be the bonding molecular orbital, O for orbital, okay? And it's also fuzzy. The key thing here to note is that <coughs> when these two atomic orbitals come together, they actually create a molecular orbital that is larger than the strict sum of these two individual atomic orbitals. That extra space that the electrons can now occupy, because originally you had one electron here and one electron here, now you have two electrons in here, that extra space will lower their energy. Right? So if we were drawing our graph like before, we said, okay, we had an orbital that looks like this, and we had an orbital that came in phase, we're just making the in phase assumption for right now. When we graph them together, it would look something like this. Little circus tent, whatever. This is the bonding molecular orbital, and we give it a name. We call it the sigma bonding molecular orbital, or sometimes just called sigma bond, or sometimes just called sigma. Unfortunately, there's also the possibility of out of phase. So if I have hydrogen and it has a particular phase, whichever one, and let's see if I can't change my pen colors to represent a different phase. Red is bad, right? So we have a red hydrogen and he's red, they are out of phase. They don't agree with each other. So when they come together, we don't get the bonding molecular orbital. We do not get constructive orbital overlap. We actually get destructive orbital overlap. And so we kind of get something that looks like this. Kind of like these two blobs. Oops, excuse me, that one should be red. Let me change that real quick. Go up to uh, red. This one should be red. And they're still fuzzy, of course. I'm just drawing them very quickly. So, Okay, so we get one like that. They still disagree with each other. They're not happy about it. And they get this little dotted line in the middle, which we call a node. A node is a place in an atom, electron, molecule, whatever. Or not an electron. Atom, orbital, or molecule that no electron density exists inside there, right? So if we're going to model our out-of-phase orbital overlap, just like we did before, we said one of them has a wave function that looks like this. The other one now has a wave function because it's out-of-phase. The exact same function, but with, if you're doing the mathematics, it would be negative of this function, right? But we're not going to worry about positive and negative. We're just going to say they don't agree constructively, right? Electrons are standing waves, and so when they overlap with each other, they do not agree overlap constructively, and so you get something that looks kind of like this. Always easy to draw. Right. 
and the node, this, this dotted line, the, the node is the entire dotted line, and if you notice, it's right at the zero mark. There is zero electron density. This should be nice and smooth. Come on, stupid computer. Right, there's zero electron density at that node. There's not constructive overlap. And so this is necessarily a higher energy state for those electrons than when they started in the original atomic orbital. All right, so what they'd like to do is get together in phase, have lots of space to run around, therefore their energy lowers and they're happy. Unfortunately, if they come together out of phase, <coughs> if they come together out of phase, then they don't have as much energy to run around, one electron, one electron, even though they can crisscross, and you end up with this, what we call sigma star, and this is called the antibonding sigma molecular orbital. I'm just going to write M for molecular orbital. We signify it with like a little asterisk or a little star, and that means that we're referring to the antibonding orbital. Energetically, we can graph this. We can say, suppose we had our hydrogen and our hydrogen overlap. So we had a hydrogen that has a 1s orbital and has an electron in it. And we have another hydrogen that has a 1s orbital and has an electron in it. When they overlap constructively and they form the large molecular orbital, that gives the electrons more space to exist within. And like I said before, whenever you take charge, positive or negative, and you give it more volume, the energy of that charge decreases. And so we get the bonding molecular orbital, orbital, which is called sigma. Remember, it looks something like this. And unfortunately, whenever that happens, it's automatically the case that you're also going to form the antibonding orbital at the same time. And this is where a little bit of philosophy comes in, because people say, well, there's two electrons in the sigma bond, and so they're in the sigma orbital. The sigma orbital exists, right? But at that same time, the sigma star orbital, in my opinion, exists. It's just not populated with um, an electron. And there's things you can do to populate it if you want to. We talked a little bit about that, but it's kind of a tangent, so I won't mention it here. Right? The amount of energy saved, meaning the amount of energy the electrons decrease by having this extra volume to move around within in the molecular orbital, is exactly that of the amount of energy <coughs> um, retained or added Actually, added would be a better word because you're actually increasing the energy, you're not keeping the same amount, you're increasing it. So I'm going to use the word added. Those two amounts are the exact same. But the molecule <coughs> is actually getting away with a little bit of a trick here because, because it's actually populating the sigma orbital, it's saving the energy. And since it's not populating the sigma star orbital, that means the energy is not actually added. It would be added if two electrons are put into this orbital, but since we only have two electrons to start with, they always go to the lowest energy state, that's what electrons do, and they go into the molecular orbital, and that's why bonds happen. And then on the paper, we would just draw it like this, with this stick representing our sigma bond. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that's hydrogen, that's nice and simple. Let's move on to something more complex. Let's take chlorine, Cl2. Right? Chlorine is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5, right? So it needs one electron, it's a halogen, wants to have a, <coughs> a full octet. Right? If we draw out the valence shell, the valence shell is the shell that has the most outer, the outermost shell that has electrons, right? That's the one that we care about in chemistry because that's the one that often does stuff, right? It would be 3s, has two electrons in it. And then 3p, there are 3p suborbitals, px, py, pz, all degenerate to each other. And we have five electrons to spend, so we go like that. And it gives us something like this, right? This is our electronic configuration. It's not exactly true in chlorine, Cl2, that this is what it looks like because of that hybridization thing that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to talk about that next. Right? <coughs> Since we're using p orbitals now, we're not using s orbitals, now we have to worry about the additional factor of geometric location in space, right? So for example, I said the px orbital, or maybe I said py, it actually doesn't matter what you want to call it, right? Looks something like this. So instead of using the red and um, 
the red and black color before. I'm just going to use shaded and non-shaded. So p orbital phases, instead of being the entire thing is one phase and the entire thing is the other phase, p orbitals actually turn out that one lobe of is one phase and the other lobe is the other phase. So if you have two chlorine molecules that are going to bond together and they're going to use their p orbitals, there's two combinations that they can do that if they use the same py or pz or px orbital. Right? They can come together in phase and make a bonding molecular orbital, which looks something like this. This would be our sigma bond. Or, unfortunately, they can come together out of phase where they disagree with each other and they form their antibonding molecular orbital, just like for hydrogen. In the antibonding case, right, I do something like this, and I had shaded this side, and I had something like this, like that. And p orbitals are a little bit different than s orbitals. They're a little bit more flexible at what they can do. Right, so this would be our sigma star orbital. This would be our node, just like before. There is zero electron density in the space between them, and there are two electrons that are bouncing around in between all four lobes, the two shaded and the two non-shaded. Right? Because p orbitals have these two lobes that are mm, that are attached to another, one another, so to speak, electron density is free to jump from one lobe to the next, to the next, to the next. Since this node basically says no one's allowed in this area, the electrons don't like to be near it, and so the greater amount of electron density is kind of on these large lobes on the outside, so to speak, away from the nuclei uh, or from the node itself, right? So if you imagine grabbing one lobe of a p orbital, so let's say I take a p orbital and it looks like this, and it's shaded, and I take this and I squeeze it real hard, I can essentially turn the lobes like this, right? Or I could do the opposite. If I have a p orbital and I grab this side with my hand and squeeze it and put a lot of force on it, right? One lobe will get really big and the other one will get really small. The phase would remain the same, but you can kind of shift the electron density from one side to the other. That's all I'm saying with that. So it's not a huge deal, but it's just some kind of neat thing that p orbitals can do, and it does have some level of impact on their chemistry. Just like with hydrogen, we can draw our molecular orbital diagram. That's what this is. If we take two p orbitals, we'll call it the pz this time. It doesn't matter which one, as long as they're the same as each other. And they come together in a head-to-head -head fashion, just like I just drew. We get a sigma orbital and sigma star, something like that. Since we're starting out with two electrons, we have to end up with two electrons. We're starting out with two atomic orbitals, right? a pz from one and a pz from the other. Therefore, we necessarily have to end up with two molecular orbitals. The number of orbitals in has to be equal to the number of orbitals out. Right? You can't create and destroy orbitals. So you can just shuffle them around and recombine them. This will give us our sigma. This will give us our sigma star. Since it's not populated, the molecule will actually save energy by actually making this bond, right? which looks, like I said a second ago, like that. Okay. Of course, we can mix other things together as well. We don't have to just mix chlorine and chlorine. We can mix hydrogen and chlorine, for example, like in HCl. Right? Hydrogen has a 1s orbital, chlorine. If we're using the p orbital from before, the pz or the px, the one that comes to head in head-to-head -head overlap, right, let's say we have this shade, and we'll use hydrogen will be that shade, so that they come together in phase, it would give us a sigma bonding molecular orbital that looks like something like this. The hydrogen nucleus would be actually inside the lobe of the kind of what we'll call sp hybrid orbital, and it would be shaded, right? It would look like that. So the chlorine nucleus is here, hydrogen nucleus is here inside that orbital, electron density is all around it, and the other little lobe is there. Okay. You should be able to draw the molecular orbital diagram for that. I would like you to do that on your own when you get a chance, just to make sure you understand what we're talking about. And you should also be able to draw what the orbital looks like if this happens. You have hydrogen, and it comes together out of phase with the chlorine. What do you get? Try and do that. Shouldn't be too difficult. If you're in class, you already know the answer. Okay, but then there's these other p orbitals, right? So we were just talking about the head-to-head -head overlap, where two orbitals come smashing into each other along the same axis. But what happens if I had an orbital like that, 
or an orbital like this, right? So this is in the up-down axis, so normally this is y, this is x, and this is z. Right? We already took care of the pz. What happens if they overlapped in a side-to-side -side fashion, right? Think about oxygen as our example. O2. Right. Oxygen is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, and if you're having trouble remembering how to do these electron configurations, you might want to go back and look it up, but it's not a huge deal, so don't spend lots of time on it. Right? has four electrons, has six total in the valence, so it needs two to make a full octet. So essentially one way to think about that is that it needs a double bond. Right? If it has six electrons and it needs eight, every that means it needs two. Every time you need an electron, you need a bond. So oxygen needs a double bond. So it should look like that. And if you do the formal rules for drawing Lewis structures, you should get something like that for oxygen. Okay. Okay, so with oxygen we have 2px, the 2s orbital is full, so we have 2px, 2py, 2pz, we have four electrons to spend, one, two, three, and four, right? So essentially we have to put an electron here, we have to put an electron here, we get a full octet, yada yada. Well, px is full, it was that head-to-head -head overlap thing that we just talked about a minute ago, so I'm going to let that go. Right. I'm going to talk about the next orientation, which would be the side-to-side -side overlap. So suppose I had an oxygen atom. Come on, computer, you could do this. Thank you. Suppose I had an oxygen atom and another oxygen atom that are going to bond together. But when they came together, their p orbitals didn't line up head-to-head, -head, like up here. But instead, they lined up, luckily, in phase, because they're lucky little oxygens. They need to go to Vegas. <coughs> When they overlap side to side, the bonding molecular orbital that they make is a very different shape, geometry, and energy. And I like to think of it as a hamburger bun. A McDonald's hamburger bun. Right? You go to McDonald's, the meat is in the middle, and the hamburger bun hangs over the sides. I don't go to McDonald's. I don't know why I'm talking about McDonald's. I ate breakfast this morning. Anyway, you get a molecular orbital that looks like this. Right? That's our molecular orbital. What, uh, it's not a sigma molecular orbital anymore because sigma orbitals come about through this head-to-head -head overlap, through the S to P overlap, or the P to P head-to-head -head overlap. This is side-to-side -side overlap, right? So this part of the orbital is kind of overlapping with this side of the orbital. They smash into each other on the side. The geometry and the energetics are different, and so you get a different shape and energetic molecular orbital. And this we call the pi molecular orbital. Right? Just like I said before, what happens if they came together out of phase? Hmm, so sad. What would happen? Well, you'd still get a molecular orbital, but unfortunately, because they disagree now, they're not happy about it, the energy goes up, you get what's called a pi star molecular orbital. Looks kind of something like this. Like little smurf hats or teardrops, right? So the phase remains the same, that doesn't change. You have the node in the middle that says, uh, 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 no electron density allowed, right? And because p orbitals are a little bit more floppy, so to speak, than an s orbital that we were talking about earlier, they can kind of push over a little bit cleaner than the spherical orbitals from earlier. So they're a little bit more warped, if you will, right? We call this the pi star molecular orbital. And just like before, we can draw our molecular orbital diagram. That's what this thing is called. We said I'd take a go to my next page. Where am I? We'll take a p orbital, or we'll take all of our 2p orbitals from oxygen. One, two, three. What? I did not do that. This computer's broken. I know how to draw. Excuse you. I am an artiste. Two, three, four. And we'll take the other 2p orbital. One, two, three, four. Okay. We have uh, six orbitals in, so we have to have six orbitals out. <coughs> and so if the one of the p orbitals comes together in the head-to-head -head fashion, we'll generate our sigma bond, for example, just like I mentioned. Uh, let me go up even further. Right here, right? We generate our sigma bond, our head-to-head -head p, or p orbital overlap. So that's one molecular orbital. Whenever we make a a bond, we also make the antibond. That will be our sigma star. We'll take two electrons, one from each, one from here, one from here. We'll populate our sigma orbital. And then there are two combinations that we can do our side-to-side -side orbital overlap. We could do Py with Py, and we could do Pz 
with PZ. And I didn't draw the PZ with PZ, but it would essentially just be this, right? This one overlapping with this one to give you a molecular orbital. That's like this, and then kind of like that, right? Same thing, just oriented in space, 90 degrees, rotated. So if the other two combinations gives us pi orbitals, we get a pi orbital and a pi orbital. So that's three pi molecular orbital, two, excuse me, that's two molecular orbitals that are of the pi type. And of course, whenever we make a molecular orbital, we also make the same equivalent antibonding orbital. How many electrons do we have left? We have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We've already spent two, so we have six left. One, two, three, four, and unfortunately, five and six. So this will be what we call the molecular orbital diagram for O2. So now we say, well, why does O2 actually make bonds? What's the point of this, right? You're just you're starting to populate your uh, your pi star, your antibonding orbitals. Why would you do that? Well, if you take the do this, do a little bit of math, and say, well, I start out with eight electrons at some energy level, and of those eight, six of them get to go to much lower energies. Only two of them are going up in energy. So if you think about this one canceling out this one, and this one canceling out that one, you're still net saving energy. So it's still good to do bonds or to make these bonds in this type for oxygen in this example. All right, so I think that's about to where we got last time. Next, uh, next time on Monday, we're going to start talking about hybridization, specifically about carbon, because again, we're doing organic chemistry, so we really care about what carbon is up to. We're going to talk about his different hybridization schemes and how they don't really have this type of organization, but rather they hybridize, they mix match their orbitals, and they give something different. So please do chapter two homework when you get a chance. You should be able to do it by now. Um, I think I said it was due yesterday. Yesterday was the 22nd. I said it was due Wednesday the 29th. Um, I think that will be fine. Um, if you have trouble with it, I'll be on campus about an hour before lecture, 4.30ish. I should be either in the tutor center or hanging around that area. So come find me or send me an email and say you'd like to meet and we can work on stuff if you need to. It's a good habit to get into now. Just do a little bit of stuff each day. So, Alright guys, good luck. Let me know how it goes. Have a good weekend. Ciao.